So this is Drew Pavlou with Bold Cutter and I'm very honoured today to be meeting one of my favourite Australian riders, one of my favourite riders full stop, Gerald Murnane. Uh, Gerald, thank you so much for meeting with me. Thanks, Drew. We're in uh, Horsham, which is country Victoria. We're in the Botanical Gardens. I was travelling to Adelaide for some uh, political activities and I thought, why not stop over to try and meet with Gerald on the way back because I've been a big fan of his work for a while now. And um, yeah, Gerald was very... Uh, very generous with his time. I rang up the Balls Club and they passed on a message. And yeah, now we're meeting today. And I'm, 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 it's, I'm very honoured, Gerald. Thank you very much for agreeing to sit down and talk with That's me. That's right. Your first mistake was to ring up the Bowls Club. I don't like <laughs> playing bowls. I never have and never will. You yep. should have. It, it, the golf is my sport. Uh, but even yeah. if you, even if you'd phoned them, they were closed that day. The good thing is we're here together anyway. Yeah, I was going. To, I was. Mm. Now I realise it should have been the Garrett Golf Club. Yeah. Now. I, I find it very difficult to characterise your work, and I think many people would say that. It's because it's, it's at the junction of fiction and essay. And I guess the way I would try and describe it would be, and I think you say this in your book, um, which is, I've been reading recently, Invisible Yet Entering Lilacs, which is a great book of essays. And I think you say, your writing is like dreams within dreams. You're, you're, you're investigating you know, the outer limits of your own mind. That's a good expression to say. I uh, have uh, a peculiarity, or a lot of people might have it, I think uh, very much in terms of space. Um, yeah. And to me, the mind is a space. Um, and it has a, a near side and a far side. And I'm sitting here today and just thinking about ordinary things, but when I get in front of the typewriter, my old 50-something year old typewriter, I tend to be further away on the far sides of my mind because, as I said, it's space and it has a far side. And uh, and I wonder what's even further away. So maybe that's why I write. Mm. Yeah, I, I was going to say this about it. I think your work, it's almost like you've conquer conquered like an Everest of the human mind in a way. I'm not, I'm not trying to piss in the pocket or anything, but I, I think it's, you've actually reached limits of the human mind that few have reached. Well, and for that reason, I would say you're not just a great Australian writer, you're a great you know, world writer. You've actually contributed something so much, I think, to the human experience, to the human story. Um, and you've done that just from uh, countryside Victoria. Uh, well, I've lived most of my life in the suburbs of Melbourne, uh, yeah. My parents were born in this part of Victoria, or not far from here, and I always dreamed of coming back. But to get back a moment, not just the far sides of my mind, but um, the far sides of fiction. Yeah. And uh, f fiction can be very simple, what I call film script fiction, where people are saying things to each other and fighting and loving and arguing and disagreeing, uh, or fiction can be um, something that has um, a kind of silence and uh, an other, a far away um, location uh, and scenes or possible things, scenes happening that are only possible in the imagination and that maybe partly describes some of my fiction. Yeah. But I do like to repeat again that idea that um, I'm, I'm, I'm going further somewhere, uh, yeah. away, from, away from the places that most writers uh, confine themselves to. Yeah, because you famously never travel on a plane, right? But I think you've actually gone further than most Australians ever have in many ways, and just within your own mind, really. I, I remember the, um, a quote that Curtsy wrote about you, and he said, I, I think he was actually re-quoting you. you. He said that there was a time where you, you were writing and you felt that you were dead and your characters were alive. Or not characters, but image persons were alive. What, well, what, could you explain that maybe? What, well, <clears throat> you're talking about uh, a book that even I don't understand. And this, yeah. this, this is... I, look, y you've only known me for 10 minutes, but you yeah. know that I'm a fairly ordinary person that doesn't put on airs or graces yeah. or pretend to be someone else. But but when I start writing, I change. Uh, yeah. And I go uh, into a... Uh, I don't know. It's I, 
you might think this is crazy, but I have written quite a few passages and even one whole book that I don't quite understand myself. Yeah. And that we better stick to the one subject. The book is inland. Yeah. And I wrote it because I was very much moved by a passage in another book. And the passage in another book, well, the other book was a book about um, growing up in Hungary about 120 years ago, 100 years ago anyway. It was a book of memory and autobiography and sociology, not nothing to do with fiction. Plans of something. Yeah. Well, it was what? called, the, the book was called People of the Pusta. People of the Pusta. The Pusta is, is, is in Hungary, in, in, when it's used in that sense, was the... Uh, the great estates owned by the aristocrats and the wealthy merchants uh, who owned these huge farms and there were workers who were like slaves on the farms and one of these uh, young workers, a, a woman, drowned herself in a well and after I read about that and when I learned about her story and why she drowned herself I wanted to write a book and the way I wrote the book it sounds crazy, it, I still think I may be wrong but the way I think of it now is I, I made myself a little tiny black and white piece of writing and I inserted myself into the book. That's wow. talking as if it was a fair, I'm talking as if I, it's just a fairy story. Um, I, I almost imagined a character like myself being part of the book and things began to change. I was writing and thinking as if I was in Hungary a hundred years ago and, yeah. and, and then I was, wondering if I was alive or dead because all the people I was writing about were dead and it gets more and more complicated and one day I tried to explain this book to somebody in a long letter and I stopped trying to explain it and I said I will never understand this book uh, it is a mystery to me and so that's the book that uh, Kurtzie is talking about. That's quite fascinating that mystery when do you think of it as a gift that that thing inside you that that like almost mystery that you can reach do you well things um, I never ever use the expression unconscious mind yeah. uh, something something prevents me uh, from believing in an unconscious mind um, I when I think of my mind I think that as far as I can go in that mind there is still somewhere else to go yeah. uh, and the, the thoughts that I write down when I'm writing quite often come from past where I am, from a place that uh, you might say, well, what's the difference? Isn't it the unconscious? No, I, I don't think that way. It, when I go there, it's it's clear and the sky above me is the same sky as the, over the rest of my mind. See, mm. now I'm talking about the mind as if it was a country. <laughs> so, uh, I know that's not <clears> a great <throat> theme of your work. <laughs> the, uh, well, yeah, the, the, the mind is a country like, a little bit like this country, but there's mysteries in it. Yeah. Um, that I haven't yet discovered or solved. What What do you find? What are the greatest mysteries to you about the mind? How far it reaches. Where does how it? Where it reaches. Where, how far can it go? And the other other mystery was uh, this is bringing up a totally different subject. Yeah. When I was a very small boy, uh, after I'd learned about horse racing from my father, and listened to horse races being broadcast on the radio, I began to see at the far parts of my mind horses, race horses, yeah. with jockeys wearing coloured clothes, and they weren't the horses that my father knew in Melbourne or Sydney, uh, they were horses that nobody knew except me. Uh, and where were they coming from? Uh, where were they, uh, what races were they running in? What were yeah. their names? And uh, these, that was a little mystery that I um, had to solve one day. And uh, there's, and I wrote a, um, well, I've got an, if you look up you, you Google the three archives of Gerald Monane. Yeah, I'm aware that. Well, there's one of those archives is, an, uh, is a horse racing archive. Yeah. And in it, there are some of the horses that I've been seeing all my life uh, at the far sides of my mind. Yeah, yeah. that's that's quite remarkable. I have read about your horse racings in, and your archives, and it's quite fascinating to me. I I almost um, felt a bit of kindred spirit in a sense because um when I was younger. For me, horse racing was uh, football, association football, European football, and I would also think of, like, you know, imaginary teams, the perfect goal well, in my mind. Well, I played, uh, I invented a, 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 a cricket, a yeah. cricket, a cricket game once where 
Um, the results came about from the uh, occurrence of vowels and consonants in pages of newspaper writing. Yeah. And these were imaginary. That was in a, it was in Tasmania actually. Yeah. It only lasted for about six months, and I went back to the horse racing. Yeah. But I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, the world. Uh, I put it another way. Um, it sounds a horrible thing to say that the world isn't interesting enough because it's pr it's pretty yeah. interesting as we both know. Yeah. But um, there must be some small children, and they don't grow up some of them uh, yeah. there may be some of them two of them sitting on this seat uh, <laughs> there are maybe some children for whom the world even though it's interesting is not interesting enough well I didn't decide I bet you didn't I mean that, that you you felt as if that football was somewhere and you had to go and see it yeah. I feel as if those races are being run right now and I want to know what's going on yeah yeah, yeah. I didn't wish I mean I didn't Created, I, I felt as if it was created for me, and, and you were exploring it yeah, or yeah, discovering yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, it's that's so interesting. I, for me, it's almost the same these days. It's not so much football, but politics, political yeah, philosophy. Yeah. Um, I often like have long. I often just sit and think for many hours about what a perfect society would be like, and what would be the most moral society, and things like of that nature. And yeah, it's just, I guess it's, um, it's almost like it, it does exist, but it's, it's out there somewhere else. It's, it's an, it's an ideal. There's a, there's a, uh, now, <laughs> I nearly said philosophy, you know, I'm in the presence of someone who's studied a lot of philosophy, I think. I Not found, too much, I sadly. found philosophy very difficult. Uh, I managed yeah. to pass one unit yeah. at university uh, because it was a compulsory unit. Um, there's, but I also studied some Middle Eastern philosophy uh, nice. when I did another subject at university many years ago and they got a lot of their philosophy from the Greeks mm. and there was one notion that I found very interesting and it was the notion of possibility. Yeah. And it sometimes seems to me that anything is possible um, if, if, if it can be thought about yeah. or conceived of um, and I used the expression once in a piece of short fiction called um, land deal which, yeah. which could be about was probably about the indigenous Australians I dared to write about them in way back when it was possible to do that and right. in that I used the expression anything was possible except the actual right. because this is not the actual now it's not yeah. possible yeah <laughs> I understand you I understand <clears throat> you the real world that we inhabit is a lot more limited yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> when did you first I guess discover that you had that ability to discover new worlds and did you ever did you think of it as a gift or I thought everybody had it um, yeah uh, I, one thing I've, um, I, I've I, yes I can bring this in uh, if yeah. I went if my mother would take us to the to, we call them the pictures the movies uh, pictures yeah. we call them in Bendigo in the 1940s if I saw a film that interested me I wanted immediately to go home to my backyard, which was not a garden, it was just weeds and dirt and uh, hens uh, that my father kept. And I wanted to go to, but, but it, because it was such a rough and untidy backyard, it was full of possibilities, there's yeah. that word again. And with the stones and the twigs and the dead leaves and the uh, um, branches I could break off, I could make pretend farms, pretend country. and. I would come home from watching a movie and I yeah. would I would put the characters from the movie that interested me into my pretend country and I would have adventures with them. Yeah. I didn't think like this then, but I think like this now. Maybe I thought I can do better than that. Yeah. It was very interesting, but I think it could be more interesting. And the yeah. other the other notion that I was entertaining but I didn't know it at the time was what a pity that movies have to come to an end or stories have to come mm. to an end and so in some of my later books I examined the possibility that the characters in fiction uh, we only see them for a few hundred pages and when we stop seeing them they're still there they're going on yeah. living their lives and and continuing their in their country of fiction yeah that's that's very interesting I, I've often felt that way when I when I read something that really that really uh, you know you don't, me. you don't want it to end. I mean, yeah. well, why should it end? We, why let, should it end? Let it keep going in the land of possibility. Yeah. Mm. So you think it, it actually exists in, a, in another world? 
I can't say that the way a philosopher would say it. If I say it, uh, yes, I do in a way. Um, I call the, the creatures that inhabit that world personages because I don't. If I think they're no different from the people in this yeah. park where we're sitting, then um, maybe I'm losing my sense of reality a bit. So I distinguish between we are persons sitting in yes. this world. If I go home and write about you, you become a personage. Yeah. And there are other personages that maybe never lived in this world, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm content to believe that they have a, an existence of their own. But I don't hope I, I hope I don't fall guilty to mixing them up with with persons. Yes, but yes. I love the word personage. It covers. It allows for a lot of uh, freedom. Yeah. So what do you think defines a personage? What what makes a personage? Any a personage is anything. Any person who any entity that can yeah. be conceived of yeah a personage yeah so a personage could extend outside of human a human i suppose so yeah yeah i don't go into the realms of science fiction i think there's enough yeah enough wonders in just contemplating uh, humanity look yeah there's a piece of fiction in a book of mine called a history of books it's called you hope i hope you read it once uh, yeah. one day it, 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 the, the history of books is uh, um, about 120 pages of a pe of a work called a history of books, yeah. And because it was a hardly enough to fill between two covers, yeah. With a publisher and I agreed to put in three other pieces of short fiction, not really connected, but but still not yeah. unlike. And one of those three was called Last Letter to a Niece. And at Last Letter to a Niece, a man who's single, uh, he's uh, never been married, he's lived alone most of his life on a farm in a lonely part of Victoria, on the southern coast, and he's writing a letter to his niece. And at the end, I, I, it's not a suspense story, so I say that yeah. at the end it's revealed that he has no niece, he, she never existed, but all, a lot of, for a lot of his life he wrote letters to her to explain himself to a young woman yeah. who was not a romantic relationship because she was his niece, but she was a young woman and he needed to talk to a female. Yeah. And um, one of the things he explains to her, <clears throat> or he thinks he's explaining it, is that the purpose of fiction, now this gets a bit complicated, the purpose yeah. of fiction, I begin to believe, dear niece, that the purpose of fiction is to bring together invisible personages mm. uh, through the means of actuality. Uh, and that means that, um, that when you read one of my books, you're yeah. reading about personages that were in my mind um, yeah. But that, but that, but you couldn't have read about them except that a book had you had to meet them through a book. Yeah. And here's another thing about me: what I did with my hands then means proves that I do think about space. And uh, when I'm thinking about mental things, I don't just go like that. Yeah. As if it's all in the mind. I see it as <laughs> happening yeah. somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I, I I had this thought once when I was reading your work. In another. Do you think in another lifetime you could have been a physicist or a mathematician? There's a, um, if I'd been properly taught, I would have understood maths a lot more. I, That's I, my I, problem too. I never was properly oh, taught. taught. Taught by dunces. Um, well, in one of, uh, in in the, you've asked some very smart questions. Oh, thank you. In, I appreciate it. In one of my, the, the big archive is called the chronological archive, yeah. which is letters and journals and, and essays and thoughts and stuff. I... To remind me where things are, the important things, I've put labels. When you look, if you go to the to Google uh, the three archives of Gerald Manane, you'll see yeah. pictures of these labels. Um, and one of the labels, but I haven't been able to find it lately, I've been busy and haven't had time because there's 24 drawers packed full. Yeah. One of the labels says fiction and quantum physics. Yeah. Now, f f heaven forgive me, if a quantum physicist is listening to this, he might um, um, you know, um, spit his tea out for, 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 for uh, anger or annoyance. But yeah. this is what something along what I wrote. All of the absurd propositions that I read about when people say quantum physics uh, 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 comes up with absurd notions like one thing can be in two places yes, or one thing cut. can be two things at once. I said, I've already written about these matters in my fiction. Yeah, that yeah. One thing can be more than another, two things can be in one place. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like you're like a metaphysician in a way or, yeah, <clears throat> I, I feel your work is almost like ex exploring physics or mathematics from a different approach, well, or a different angle. Well, uh, 
if it is, I wonder why these trucks have to go around and... Yeah, around so I, I will talk a little bit about how I got to know your fiction and your work. I actually discovered it reading the New York Times profile of you um, that came out some years ago. And it said, and it, it was asking the question, is the next Nobel, Prize, Nobel laureate for literature tending the bar in a dusty Australian town? And I found it was very interesting that I'd never been taught your fiction. I'd never discovered it. You know, I was always someone who loved literature when I was growing up. I loved Australian writing. And yet the first time I ever discovered your writing was through the New York Times, an international publication. And it's quite interesting that, you know, never in my high school and never in my university English literature studies, I happened upon your work. And yeah, I was wondering like, why do you think that might be? Why do you think the, that almost at times in Australia, it feels like your work has not been well, um, as they say, don't get me started, but yeah. you have. <laughs> yeah. um, the uh, phrase I've used lately in the last uh, years is marginal. Yeah. People say to me, people ask me exactly what you've asked, and I say, because for, well, how many years, it, well, the first book was published in 75, that's uh, yeah. 25, 45 years ago. Yeah. For the first 30 years of that, certainly, or more, I was a marginal writer, which is a nice way of saying, another way it could be saying unpopular, yeah. uh, ignored is another word. Yeah, uh, I didn't, outsider. I didn't part. fit outsider, I didn't fit the uh, expectations of so many uh, reviewers. I never, yeah. I never was, I never felt rejected by readers. I thought if ever a large body of readership gets the opportunity to read me, yeah. and if they're not put off by some of the fairly cool reviews or the um, the just um, being ignored, the, yeah. the uh, uh, sort of p uh, turning away from it. Yeah. The other word I often use is fashion, and yeah. it's 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 a sad thing to say this, but um, as clothes and motor cars and and habits of speech and every other thing is governed by fashion, so too as as are books and literature yeah. at my sort of writing, and I'm lucky to, to to be in the position I am now because there were times when um, people almost turned. I, I, I was, it was going to happen in the 1990s, um, yeah. probably if I kept, I stopped writing for 10 years, right, right. <clears throat> just for various reasons. But, yeah. But it wouldn't have. Uh, but what well, I could have given as the reason because nobody uh, is interested in me much. The book that was published in 1995, Emerald Blue, I doubt yeah. if it sold maybe seven or eight hundred copies. People say to yeah. me now, I can't get hold of Emerald Blue. Where? How do I get hold of Emerald Blue? Well, they can now because it's half, all the contents of Emerald Blue are in the collected short fiction. Yeah. But the book itself is almost impossible to find because only about six or seven hundred copies were sold. Yeah. And that was the bottom point of my career. And yeah. my, my wife, who died about 12 years ago, she, in her last year, she said one day, they, people will discover you and what yeah. they've been missing and she was right that it happened after her death. So yeah. look, put it down to fashion, um, people, it only takes one bad review, Yeah. The landscape with landscape, one bad review, uh, a nasty uh, review which made a personal attack on me and, and uh, mm. innocent, innocent um, readers are put off, they think oh look, I don't bother reading that. Now as for yeah. the American Australian thing, yeah, I, the Americans didn't know when, when my book Inland, which I mentioned before, my book yeah. Inland fell onto the desk one day of an American editor called Jeremy Davies yeah. about 10 years ago. And he was working for a small publisher and he said, he's told me since, that is the most impressive moving book of fiction I have ever read. Yeah. Who wrote it? And he asked Australian people, I said, oh, Gerald Manane, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, Gerald Manane. Yeah. Well, he, he made sure that I got published in New York when he yeah. later moved to New York. And they, they didn't know, the people who published me and praised me in New York, they didn't know that in Australia I had a, a place in the pecking order, number 17 out of 24 or whatever it yeah, was. Yeah. They just looked at the book. Yeah. And for the first time they said, well, we don't know anything about this bloke. So Mark Benelli got to read me and he came out here to do the article yeah. um, and and look what happened. There were a, a, lot, a lot of Australians with perhaps a little bit less courage than they should have, they yeah. said, oh, Gerald Manane must be a bit better than we thought because they, they're, reading, they're praising him in America, yeah, in yeah. New York. Because we still, in a, many ways, I, I think we still haven't gotten over the cultural cringe. It used to be Britain, now it's America. That's so, I was hoping you'd use that expression. It, was, it invent, is true, was an, invented by a man called 
A. A. Phillips, who was a yeah. uh, he was a head teacher of a Wesley College in Melbourne, uh, yeah. or a senior teacher and a critic and a writer, and he invented that phrase, and it's still true. Look, I yeah. I myself for many years as a young writer, I I felt the same feeling. And me too, me too. Somebody, I was reading a book one day when I came to my senses. Uh, I was in my forties, early forties. I'm ashamed to say, reading a book by, published by Jonathan Cape who supposedly published the, the, the cream of, of English literature. Yeah. And I decided it was just crap. <laughs> yeah, and and yeah. it wasn't worth reading. And I took it off my shelves and, and, and put it in a collection to be given to an op shop. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, just because Jonathan Cape published it, I'm supposed to think this is better than anything I can do yeah. in the other Australia. I know. It takes a long time to get over that. It takes yeah. a long time, right? Because yeah. even as a young person, you always have this sense, I think, and it's just sort of inculcated in you from such a young young age, like the rest of the world is happening elsewhere. And what we have to ha, have to say as Australians or what we experience almost, is not important. Almost comes naturally to yeah. us. And we travel in the 60s when I was in my 20s, um, pretty well all my friends went overseas. Yeah. Uh, to, uh, well, for lots of reasons, but that was a great, that was for many of them, that was the reason. Yeah. To go and see what the real important world, what's happening over there. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's you know what you said is right that when you really sit down and think about it or contemplate the issue, I mean, what anyone here in Australia has to say is just as worthy or valuable as anywhere else uh, about anything. Yeah, and yeah, uh, I I'm proud of the fact that I I stuck it out. I kept yeah. going. Um, one one thing I must say, most of the books that I've uh, that I've shown you and we've talked about are published nowadays by Giramondo. Now, Giramondo yeah. is a small publisher in Sydney and after I'd given up writing for 10 years yeah. uh, I was approached by um, Ivor Indic who's the principal of Giramondo and he wanted to he wanted to get something of mine to publish and his encouragement um, and support have allowed me to write exactly I mean I I didn't feel as if I was being censored in the early yeah. years but I wasn't, didn't feel as free as I do now yeah. to write uh, what I want to write because he, it's a wonderful thing to know that provided you fulfil their expectations, you've got a publisher willing to publish yeah. you, which yeah. I didn't know for many years in the early years. Yeah. Do you think of yourself as an Australian writer or just... Do you even think of yourself as an Australian or just no, a human I don't. being? Uh, no, actually, no, I go the other way. I think yeah. of myself... As a, as a citizen of a little corner of, when I see the, the, the I've got a globe of the world, it's a yeah. nice thing, globes are like nice things to have, yeah. they're better than maps, and I see this globe of the world, and I see this nice little corner of Australia, it's, it's a big place, as you know, yeah. the Victoria, and um, I think, you know, this is, this is enough for me, I don't, yeah. if, if I lived for another 300 years I could travel a bit further, but this is enough for one life. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to live for another 300 years? <laughs> if it was all like today uh, and uh, yesterday, yeah, but um, I think the, the ones that nearly live, who were they? The, Str the Strollbrugs in Jonathan, um, Jonathan, uh, Dean Swift, yeah, Jonathan Swift, he, he wrote about these people who were immortal. And yeah. it was no fun because yeah, they, yeah. their teeth fell out and they <laughs> yeah, yeah. all sorts of things. Do you... Oh, in that one, a, yeah. a serious answer to your question, yeah. I actually, um, if I lived that long, I think I'd write too much because yeah. five years ago I said no more writing and yeah. now, now I'm putting together a collection of essays which, oh, right, right. which will be, um, uh, I wasn't telling many people up till now, but I'm, that because I wasn't sure I'd get go ahead with it, but... I'm more than halfway through it. It yeah. won't, won't be a big book, a collection of essays published by Giramondo. Um, and I only wrote it because I felt I, I wanted to write it. Yeah. No, no, that's another good thing, that something I could say. Uh, I've never had to write for money, just as well, yeah. because it didn't make much. Yeah. Um, never had to write for money, never had to write for a living. I, I can't imagine anything worse than having to, yeah. to, because then you've got to please large numbers of people. So although I might have sounded a bit miserable and, and uh, no, complaining no. about being a marginal writer, the one thing about a marginal writer is that he or she is free to to write what they want yeah. to write. Yeah. So, so how did you support yourself through most of those oh, years? I, I always had a day job. Yeah, yeah. I start, I didn't want a career. Yeah. Uh, I, that would have taken up too much time and effort. Yeah. I started out as a primary teacher 
yeah. would, didn't want to go to university for lo- uh, one. Oh, it's too hard to explain in a short yeah. time, but it wasn't. I was. I did very well at school. I could. I've got honours yeah. in my last year. I could have easily gone uh, to Wall Street University, but I, I, I later did a part-time degree. Yeah. In my late twenties, I started as a primary teacher. That was good enough. Gave me free time to write. Yeah. Um, later on, I worked as an editor for in a government department. Right. Uh, had a couple of years support from government grants. Everybody was um, enjoying those in the 70s, and I, yeah. I got my share. Nice. Uh, after that, um, I was lucky enough. I got a job uh, at teaching. Teaching at university started off just a temporary and ended up a permanent. Um, that lasted yeah. for 16 years, and then I took early retirement. So, uh, as uh, the difference is, I wanted a job but not a career yeah and and not having to write uh, there were times if my job was busy I didn't have to write yeah no deadlines nothing it, uh, yeah, it yeah suited me very well and the other thing I'm proud to say my children and my wife didn't go without um, attention or money or uh, care or time yeah. because of my writing I didn't say sorry I'm busy writing today if they needed one one of my kids was sick for well he nearly died he was sick for three or four months and I didn't write a word. I just yeah. helped to look after him. So the family was um, not boasting because I know people who whose families were ruined and wrecked because yeah. of their their writing, <clears throat> yeah, or their art or whatever their their career was. So, do you view yourself primarily as a writer? Yes. Or, yes. I've stopped yes. thinking about anything else. Yeah. Uh, I, I, um, well, I used to say part-time writer, or, yeah. but now, no, um, the books, it's a long time since I did anything else. Yeah, I retired yeah. at the age, I retired in the mid-90s, that's 25 years right. ago. Nice, I can't nice. believe I've lived all those years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, what, what, so, you moved out now to um, Garo. Well, well, that was because of my son. Uh, I wanted to, uh, to be with one of my sons. He lived here on his own. Um, he yeah. wasn't unhappy. But I thought it's a nice way to, after my wife died, yeah. um, we were going to stay in Melbourne as long as she was alive. And uh, <clears throat> I thought I can be company, we can be companions. He's a single man. And, yeah. and he only chose Garoke by accident, uh, but it, it suited, suits me very well. Yeah. Do you think it's, um, do you think it might link into that? You, you've, I think you've talked about like an ideal almost. It's a, a, someone who treks inland and then they spend their time within these grand manor homes out on the plains the pla- with a big library and they sit within the library and. Well, I am up. where I am. Yeah. I, I, I am liter- almost literally and geographically where the plains, if it ever existed, where the plains yeah. would be. Because the plains first occurred to me when I was a small boy. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't like the ocean. I stood with my back to the. With, my grandfather, my uh, grandfather Manane, my father's father, there's a place on the coast I'm pointing. See, I, that's another thing, space, I always point. Yeah. There's a place down there called Manane's Bay. It's on the maps, uh, good maps, and it was where his farm was, and they had a beach, a rocky yeah. little beach. And we used to go there, and I didn't like the sea. I was frightened of it. I didn't learn to swim, and they teased me because I couldn't put my head in the water. And I used to stand on the cliff tops and think, instead of being down there on the sea, why wouldn't it be nice to be? I'm only a little kid. Wouldn't it be nice to be away over there? And over there was plains and yeah. uh, and grasslands and and country. Well, what would they be on the way between Warrnambool and Hamilton? And when yeah. you get to Hamilton, you see Stillwater, and that you look north, and then you're looking to Horsham. Yeah. And if you turn around at Horsham and look over towards South Australia, then you're looking to Garoke. So yeah. in a way, I was looking as a child. At the place where I where I now live, but yeah. I was but I was only dreaming about it then. And when I was writing the plains, it doesn't exist anywhere the land of the plains. But but if it had a proper existence, uh, if it was based, I should say somewhere, it's based on this area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's very interesting. So uh, I, I won't go too close, too per, too into curtsy or whatever. But he says. He asks, he says, whether the connections between the images lie implicit in the images themselves or created by a shaping intelligence is unsaid in your work. What do you think of that? And, and I know you were raised almost as, um, you were raised as a Catholic. And I know you, you actually thought about the seminary at that, a point. Yeah, yeah. And I even did that. I, I was, uh, I went to Catholic schools in my life. I've sometimes thought of that type of life. Well, but, I, I, I now live that kind of life. 
but without, yeah. without any without the vows of yeah. poverty, chastity, and yeah. obedience. Yeah. Um, I live a lot of life. Make, to go back to the images, um, images have a power. And now I'm starting to talk. Um, well, not exactly pontificating. I'm talking off the top of my head. I'm saying things which seem absolutely true to me, but the yeah. moment I start to put them into words, I know they, they sound to some people like nonsense. Do you find that's a difficulty? Do you think... I, there's that um, famous quote, and I forget who says it, but it's like all writing is almost like a desperate attempt to get it, to take out the context, contents of your own mind and give it to another. Do you feel like you've been able to do that? Do you, have you ever felt like there have been things that oh, you look, feel... You're, you're, asking you profound, you're asking profound questions, and in these essays I'm writing now, some of the questions you're asking, they take me three pages, and I don't really answer them in three pages. Yeah. So we haven't got much chance to yeah, answer yeah. in these couple of minutes. But to, and quickly in answer, images have a power that I uh, that never ceases to marvel, to amaze me, that, um, that they generate others... Uh, that, 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 that one image will just unfold like a flower and there'll be one more inside that one image will just move sideways and, and lock itself in with another yeah endless possibilities um, I have an ideal reader uh, and I can't talk about that re personage in public but that ideal reader uh, is the one I try to explain myself to yeah doesn't exist in the real world uh, may not exist anywhere, but exists in my mind while I'm writing. So that answers your question about trying to... I'm not trying to reach you, yeah. or uh, I wasn't trying to reach my... The, my, my, the, the person I, my, I was most in love with was my wife or my yeah. children. Um, I'm reaching an ideal reader. Yeah. Someone who, who may be the only person, that, or personage, I'm sorry, who will ever understand all I'm writing. And there was yeah. one last point you made. Um, oh, no, that's it. I think yeah. Yeah. Or about the um, about the spiritual question. Oh, about yeah. the um, yeah. oh the the, the uh, I was attracted. To, I didn't want to. I wasn't really going to be very good at helping people or giving them advice or yeah. or praying for them. What I was look at being quite selfish. I wanted a nice quiet room with a desk and. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I liked the idea of you know the colours of the church and the <laughs> yeah, yeah. and the and, and the ceremonies and things yeah I thought, um, and if I'd, I the other reason and I put this in yeah. one of my essays it was a way of escaping university all oh, right um, because everybody was saying you know next year is university and whatever and I'm thinking oh, I don't want to go there I don't want to go there and that that's I've a, had a bad experience at university myself well that's a strange I didn't want people to tell me how to read books mm. that's. I, 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 I didn't know. I, I don't know how I got first honours in English literature. At the, we called it the matriculation, yeah. the set, which I did. I don't. I just wrote what I thought they wanted me to write. It yeah. wasn't what I really believed. Right. And and I, even when I studied as a part-time student, I nearly failed some of the English subjects. Here's me, yeah. the man who's written 15 books. I nearly yeah. failed academic yeah. English because I just didn't want to know what they were. They, I didn't share their views about things, writing, yeah. and so it was no use to me as a writer. Yeah, honestly, I've, I've felt that way myself studying English literature. Like, <clears throat> it's almost like there's a big cut-off between literary criticism and the actual practice of fiction, yes. and they're almost yeah. completely different worlds. Well, I was going home in my holidays in the late 20s, I was writing the first drafts of Tamil and it was the difference between, um, say, working in a butcher shop and yeah. um, and 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 uh, and being a painter. So there's no connection at all. Academic. Yeah. What I wrote as an academic student of academic yeah. English, and what I wrote in my Christmas holidays writing Tamaris yeah. Grey, there was no connection. Yeah. <clears throat> Why do you think that might be? Why do you think they're so cut off from one another? Oh, I've never, I've never really thought about that. The, um, the people. Oh, well, I, I suppose if you confined yourself to being a reader yeah. and you've never tried to write, yeah. although some of them had tried to write, and were, there are books there. Lionel Trilling, who was a famous American critic, yeah. and I liked his criticism. He did make sense on occasions. Yeah. Uh, and he wrote a book, can't think of its name now, and it's set in the, the New England part of America. And it was, I could, when I read it, I realised it was, it was made, it seemed to me as if it was written as, a, as an example of a book that could be studied in yeah. in a class, it, it, yeah. it had it was a perfect. Uh, uh, the, the, per, it had all the ingredients necessary for students of English to yeah. write essays about. Yeah. It. But that doesn't answer your question. Look, well, actually, yeah. I think I read um, when you were a fiction assessor for Mianjin, 
or you were, you were you were in charge of publishing the creative writing at that paper, at that journal, and through it, yeah, and that was that was what you found difficult because you didn't like pieces of fiction that seemed contrived or seemed to be made with almost like a yeah that model template in mind. Yeah, you wanted yeah, something yeah. that was true. Well, you see. Um, and so you think it shouldn't even be written with critics in mind, I guess. Maybe that's why they always didn't like you. Yeah, oh, we get into deep... Um, one critic said about me, the trouble with Monane's writing is that the world gets left out. Well, I mean, that, that's nonsense. Yeah, it is nonsense. <laughs> Everything's the world. <laughs> yeah, and your books are <clears throat> worldly, of course. Yeah, of course. But, oh, look, no, um, I'd almost prefer not to go there. I mean, it's, yeah. it's like... It's like asking me to comment on something that I'm, I'm just not... I mean, I, and, and I might say something hurtful. Yeah, I know. I, that's, very, that's very good of you. There's, actually, one question I was going to ask. So when you talk about the very... the furthest spaces of your mind, it, do you think there's almost a spiritual dimension to that? Do you think at the furthest edge there could be something like God? If you read the essay, um, The Breathing Author... Yeah, and I've said it since. If I were to tell you that, that I um, was a, 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 a that I had a sexual deviancy or that I, I, I was uh, some kind of sexual pervert, the, um, the world, the people listening might sometimes they would be less offended than if I tell you what I'm about to tell you, which is yeah. that I believe in, in in the survival of the soul. Yeah. I don't. I no, I agree with you. I can't think of God. I've given up. I gave away thinking of God when I stopped going to Catholic church because he was too much like an old man. Uh, I don't. I, I can just about think of angels or something like that. I know. Yeah. I know that the invisible parts of my wife are still in existence. Yeah. I know that. And when yeah. you, if you read a certain chapter in something for the pain, I explain that before we died. We said well, after we die, well, first to die, we'll, we'll send the message, and and it was about horse racing, yeah. and, and the message came. So, uh, but there's other ways I know too. What, what, what was the message? No, you've got to read the book. It's too <laughs> too complicated. I see, I see. Uh, it's about horse horse racing and betting. Yeah. Um, but to get back to the question, look, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a bit foolish of me to talk about that sexual deviancy, but people get away. No, people get, I get away. What you mean. People are forgiven for all kinds of things. But there are some people who would never forgive me for the, what seems to them the utter foolishness yeah. of saying that materialism is not enough. It's but not enough. Materialism I agree doesn't begin. How, I actually uh, look at it. I look at it the other way that like materialism is the foolish answer in a way because like yes, there's so yes. there's clearly so much more to the world yeah, than just yeah. what we can see. So in so the invisible. I call it the, this is the visible world that yeah, we're in now. Yeah. The invisible parts of you and me, uh, I'm sure, will survive. Yeah, uh, and there'll be and lots of things. We'll learn, we'll learn lots of things about our present existence yeah. that we didn't. Know. And do you think your writing is trying to get to those invisible parts? It's like a spiritual practice. Well, it didn't. It didn't set out to be like that. Yeah. I, I, all I wanted was to just see what was there. And, yeah. and the further I went, the more there was there. That, yeah. And I have, I have speculated that the the last thing you get to see at the end of your mind is the beginnings of another mind when that might be the big mind. Yeah. You, you don't know. Yeah. Wow. Could the universe just be one great mind? I'm happy to be a part of it if it is. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good thing to think about. Fancy sitting in the botanic gardens at Horsham and discovering that. It's a one, it's a one, wouldn't it be nice if a whole lot of people came out from behind these trees and clapped us? Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully people will listen to us and, and learn about uh, but yeah, no, uh, you know these are the questions I'm often thinking about, and I understand now. I was going to ask you before we had this conversation. I was going to ask why was it that you that you were so resistant to talk about like matters of the time and politics and things like that. But now I actually understand as you've explained it because you're actually they're the greatest questions that are, that go underneath them all. Other people who've got interests in those things, the energy to do them, yeah, yeah. Um, um, it's it's sort of you know it, we can't all do everything yeah and, and um, so we've got different calls. I had to give up yeah there's lots I mean there's lots of books I could have read lots of uh, things I could have done well when you talk yeah. about television and something I know there's there's things a few things worth watching on television yeah I don't have the time yeah. some actually that's when I give little talks 
sometimes the people in, in uh, I'm going to talk to a, a little book club in uh, my district yeah. and not a public appearance, it's private because I once said two years ago no more public appearances, that was yeah. on my 80th birthday yeah. and these people often say where did you get the time to write it? I said, you think of how much time people spend of an evening watching TV. Yeah. Just think of how much you could do if you didn't watch. Uh, yeah. So that was one of the things I gave up. Yeah. Um, but um, the wonderful thing is that I've, um, that I've had time to do so much. For example, I spend an hour each day playing the fiddle. Yeah. Uh, I spend the two hours or three hours each day uh, adding to my horse racing archive, which is all imaginary. Yeah. Uh, and um, I play golf two days a week. And I've still got, uh, if I save a day and a half a week, I'm still writing the essays. Yeah. So it's time, a lot of it is just good time management. Do, do you think when you practice the fiddle or you, like, you know, play golf or, or even the horse races, how do you think that fits into, I mean, the world or even that life task, which is going I, to the big questions? I do you think they connect to it? Yes, but I don't know. I, I it's... Um, I don't force myself to think yeah. first. I know what you're saying. Um, I'll be on the golf course and I'll have a little, some little insight. I'll see a bird, yeah. I'll see a bird, or I'll think a thought. Um, I don't go looking for. That's yeah. a wonder. Somebody once said, "I don't go looking for any of my subject matter. It it comes looking for me." Yeah. That's that's the way I feel. Um, yeah. That I mean, I, I I'm not going to have any profound thoughts. Probably I've been too busy thinking about your questions but Sorry. but this but I could be I could be in a place like this one day not thinking of anything much and then yeah uh, and the other thing is this time delay yeah the importance of what's happening today Marcel Proust proves this and over and over again he's a great hero well the, the books uh, had a terrible influence or terribly great influence on me yeah Marcel Proust the significance of what we do today won't appear to us sometimes for years Mm. Uh, and if it's not significant, we may never think of it again. But if there's something significant about today, you'll remember this a long time after you. The, uh, you'll feel a cold gust of wind and, a, uh, and something or the sound. Well, I heard a lapwing calling out before. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and it's called Bibits in Hungarian. Uh, and it's a lovely name, Bibits. Now, that lapwing, the sound of a lapwing might bring back the memory of the afternoon. Yeah. So things are all interlocked, but you don't go looking for things. They they'll they'll appear to you and find you eventually. I think that's a, I think that's a very nice insight. I think I will remember this. Good for a right, long time. Right, right, so, all right. I, mean, mate, it, I, I think that would be a nice way to end it. Nice way to end. Yeah. Thank you so you, much, Gerald. You guys get tired of all that? <laughs> oh, no, no, <laughs> We've got our Hong Konger friends here, <laughs> Gerald. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. I really <laughs> appreciate it. I really Get a bunch appreciate. Of photos it. back. Send yeah, we've got story. really good photos. Oh, yeah. Some some good ones. Yeah. I'll show yeah. You. Now, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.